speak as long as he can. Uh, why don't we start out with 736? You know, the Bible says God's mercies are new every morning. Amen? And what a beautiful day the Lord has made. Right? We will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? 736, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. Amen? All right. If you know it, sing it out with me. 736. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing. I will sing. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness, thy faithfulness. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing, I will sing, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. Amen, amen. Praise God for His mercies. All right, well, we're going to go ahead and take up our benevolent offering again for our class this morning. Good to have you out this morning. All right, and uh, we are going to, of course, record this session too, so we have it available um, uh, if maybe you have someone who missed it. So uh, we thank the Lord for the Saxons being with us this morning. Amen. Amen. All right, and uh, I know Brother Cook said he might be here today. Yeah, he's done with uh, quarantine, and uh, so hopefully he'll maybe show up. It'd be really good to see him. I know he's been struggling and, you know, really kind of had a bout there with the heart attack and then with COVID and everything. So if you see him, you know, make sure you love on him a little bit, and we might see him for the main service. He was asking me this morning about possibly coming. Any other prayer requests this morning? Chuck? Yes, for people in Buffalo. Yeah, I read a little bit about that um, this morning. Mm, yeah, definitely. Okay. Anybody else then? Oh, there she, he was talking about a shooting in Buffalo. So, all right, Ron. Our Father, we do praise your holy name. We thank you for your goodness, Lord. You are so great and holy and righteous. We thank you, Lord, that you, you've had us every day in your hand and guided us on our lives. We thank you, Lord, for the freedom you've given the hearts in this country to be together and to gather in the house of the Lord. And, Father, we pray for those that are less fortunate, not able to do so, and help them, Lord, to worship the best they can. Mm. Be with those, Lord, that are not feeling good, and, Lord, to give them strength and help them to uh, gather together as soon as possible. We pray for Brother Cook, lay your hand upon him. Thank you for him. Pray that you strengthen him, Lord, that mm. fully and help him, Lord, to get strong enough to be able to get around like he, he did before. Yes. Pray for your blessing upon the Sunday school hour. Pray for those uh, people that are in Buffalo there and that shooting, and Lord, that they uh, find a person, and, and Lord, for those folks that probably lost some loved ones, we pray mm-hmm. for grace upon them and help them, Lord, to all those that are. Lord, we thank you for our good and good Dr. Saxon as he teaches this morning, and we give you the praise, the honor, and glory and the truth this morning. Mm, amen. Amen. Well, we are, uh, again, blessed to have the Saxons with us again, and uh, we praise the Lord uh, that he's able to come and uh, teach us some history. Amen? So we praise the Lord for your brother. Why don't you come, and, and we'll get you, get you started, all right? Did you need anything? You need any water or anything? Okay, you're all good. Okay. Good morning. So good to see you this morning. Jamie and I always enjoy I appreciate the opportunity to come down to Monroe from Watertown. I teach at Maranatha Baptist University, and our school year is over. And actually, my last day of responsibility is Tuesday, so looking forward to the summertime. And uh, this is the latest I think we've ever come. Just uh, used to come in January, and then we moved it to March, and then March got crazy and became April, and then this year April was crazy. And, but uh, it's good to be with you today. Uh, as you recall, or as you may recall, if you've been with us over the years, 
we often do stories of great Christians in the Sunday school and evening hours. I'll be preaching to you from 1 Corinthians in the morning service. And the plan for today is to talk about two missionaries. We're going to look at a missionary to the American Indians, the Native Americans, in the 17th century, a man by the name of John Eliot this morning. And then tonight, we're going to look at a woman missionary to China, a lady by the name of Charlotte Diggs Moon. She's known as Lottie Moon. So we'll talk about her in the evening service. Hope you'll get a blessing from that. The story of John Eliot, in some ways, can be a little bit sad. That is, uh, at the end of his life, as we'll see, he might have been tempted to look back and say, was it all worth it? Was it all worth it? What did it amount to? And so my theme verse for today's lesson is, Wherefore, beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And the implication there is that you don't know this because you look back and see tangible results. You know this because your labor is in the Lord. That is, you're doing what God's asked you to do. And sometimes when you do what God asks you to do, you see visible, tangible results. And sometimes you do what God asks you to do, and you don't see visible, tangible results. In fact, things don't seem to go well at all. Does that mean your labor's in vain? No. If it's in the Lord, if you're doing what God wants you to do, then it's never in vain. I, I've had the blessing. It's, it's really been striking to me. I think I've had four different people in different settings over about the last month say, Brother Dave, just want you to know what you're doing is not in vain. And each of those people didn't know the other people were going to say it to me. In fact, one of them was Dr. Sachs, who was one of my students, saying, hey, little note, keep on keeping on. It's not in vain. It's, you know, why does a student say that to their teacher? But, but it was a blessing. And uh, that's the theme for the life of John Eliot. John Eliot. So let me tell you his story real quickly. He was born in England. 1604. So we're going way, way back. That is, this is the year after Queen Elizabeth had died, Queen Elizabeth I. King James is now the ruler. The King James Bible is named after him. His parents were not nobility, but they were rather prosperous yeomen. That is, they owned property so that uh, he was able to get a pretty good education. He grew up in Essex in the little town of Nazing, which is about 20 miles from uh, he was baptized as an infant. I say baptized. I'm a Baptist. I don't believe it's baptism. But he had water dabbed on his forehead when he was an infant into the Church of England, into the Anglican Church. He was sent off to Cambridge. Cambridge wasn't far from his hometown. And he studied at Jesus College in Cambridge. He was unusually bright. We're talking about John Eliot, a uh, minister in England. Young folk, glad to have you all join us. He studied at Cambridge and finished his bachelor's degree in 1622, which means he had finished his bachelor's degree by the time he was 18. That was rare at the time. He was a very bright young man. While he was in school, though, as a teenager, at age 16, his mom died. And when he was 17, his dad died. So he sort of became the uh, head of the family. When he finished his training, he was ordained to be a minister in the Anglican Church. But the Anglican Church was having problems, and I'm not going to dive into it because it doesn't affect our story much. But people who were Puritans, who emphasized a personal experience with Jesus Christ of being born again, of pursuing holiness, of loving God's word, uh, they, were con they were experiencing persecution at this point. That is, the king of England didn't like the Puritans, especially Charles when he became king in 1625. And a lot of persecution was coming down on them. Eventually, this is going to result in about 10,000 Puritans leaving England and going to America. I've changed my mind, Pastor Matt. I, I would take some water. I'm, uh, I'm drying out as I go here. Thank you. And so... When Eliot had a chance to become a minister, the Church of England was so repressive that he decided not to do it. And instead, 
he hooked up with a lifelong friend by the name of Thomas Hooker. Now, Thomas Hooker is going to end up being one of the great American Puritans. And Thomas Hooker was running a little grammar school in Essex, Little Baddo, Essex. He, the Hooker family took young Elliot in to live with them and to just work at the parish church, uh, sort of a, as a layman. And uh, Elliot was living with the Hooker family. And here is Elliot's testimony. He says, To this place I was called through the infinite riches of God's mercy in Christ Jesus to my poor soul. For here the Lord said unto my dead soul, Thank you. Live. The Lord said unto my dead soul, Live. And through the grace of Christ I do live, and I shall live forever. When I came to this blessed family, I then saw, and never before, the power of godliness in its lively vigor and efficacy. In other words, he had grown up an Anglican. He had been sprinkled. He had gone to Cambridge. He had studied at Jesus College of all places. He had been trained to be a minister of the gospel. And he wasn't a Christian. He had never gotten saved. He had Puritan leanings. And he had never gotten saved. And now he's a believer. The pressure on Puritans got so bad that Hooker left the grammar school and moved to the Netherlands with his family. Elliot then kind of lost his job working for Hooker and the family that he'd been living with. And so he decided that, you know what, there's no place for me in England. I've heard about a bunch of Puritans going to New England with a Massachusetts Bay Company. I think I'll join them. And he sailed to Boston, arriving on November 3rd, 1631. The pressure may have been bad. We don't know exactly. What we do know is that while in Essex, he had become engaged to a godly young woman named Hannah Mumford. But Hannah was not able to leave at the time. So he sailed away without her. And that may imply that he had to sail away. That is, the pressure there on Hooker and Elliot may have been such that you get out of town or the government may arrest you. We know of other Puritans like John Cotton who literally had to sneak out of the country because he, they were being chased down by the government. When he arrived, he uh, was given a pretty nice position. The pastor of First Church in Boston was a man named John Wilson. And John Wilson needed to go back to England for a few months to settle some affairs. And he was given a leave of absence. And they asked Elian to plug into the church and preach in his place. And so he did. And the people were really impressed with his ability in the pulpit. When Wilson came back, they said, we'd like to keep Elliot, but he can't be the preacher. Wilson's the preacher. So they made him what was known as the teacher. Now, your church is not organized this way, and it shouldn't be, but these Puritan churches had a preacher, a teacher, a group of elders, and a group of deacons. This was the way John Calvin believed churches should be organized. That's not the Bible way to organize a church. We believe in pastors and deacons, and that's it. But he became the teacher of First Church in Boston, which was a rather prestigious position. I, I, let me correct myself. He was offered this prestigious position of teacher of First Church of Boston. It would have been a plum position, one of the best in the entire colony. In fact, uh, Roger Williams is going to be teacher, and then later John Cotton is going to be teacher, some of the most famous people in New England. But there was a little village called Roxbury, not too far from Boston, that had just been settled. That is, colonists were moving out from Boston and Salem and establishing little villages. And they established the village of Roxbury. And they asked Elliot to come be their pastor, much less prestigious, tiny little church, very few people just arriving, carving out homesteads, fighting off Indians, or trying to maintain peace with the Indians. And Elliot decided that that was what the Lord wanted him to do. So he took up the pulpit in this little town of Roxbury, 
And a few months later, Hannah arrived from England, and in fact, the very first wedding performed in Roxbury was John marrying Hannah Mumford. Hannah is a godly woman. She's going to bear five sons and one daughter to John. Uh, two of the sons are going to die very young. There were a lot of ways to die in colonial New England. But the other three boys are all going to also become missionaries to the Native Americans alongside their dad. Of the six children, only one son, Joseph, and their daughter, who is also named Hannah, uh, for nearly 200 years in Western society, first daughters were almost always named after their moms, and, and she was. Uh, they are going to be the only two of his six kids who outlive him because he's going to live to be 85. All right, so I'm giving that away right now. All right, he's going to live to be 85, which in, in 17th century New England is a huge blessing. Not too many people made it to 85. That did create the sadness of burying a number of his kids. And here's a quote Eliot said about that. My desire was that they should have served God on earth. But if God will choose to have them rather in heaven, I have nothing to object against it, but his will be done. And that's a good context of who the kids belong to. Our, our children belong to the Lord. And they're going to serve here if they're believers, or they're going to serve there. And, uh, and that doesn't mean he was callous towards it. He sorrowed like we do. Well, for the first 15 years that he was at Roxbury, he devoted himself to local church work. I mean, he was a busy man. Pastor Spoonhour can tell you that pastoring a congregation, whatever size it is, is busy work. It's, uh, it's not busy work. It's busy work. It's, it's hard work. And the churches in New England had rejected the bishops that ruled in the, in the English church, and they established sort of a congregational polity where each church was independent. And so Eliot and his church just functioned there in Roxbury. He did collaborate with the Boston pastors. And a couple of these collaborations are notable. In 1637-1638, a lady by the name of Anne Hutchinson got in trouble for believing that she had visions and for attacking the clergy. Now, Anne, frankly, was a godly woman, and in some of these issues, I'm on her side, but I'm not on her side. When, when they challenged her teachings, many of her teachings were very good, but when they brought her to trial and challenged her teachings, she gave the wrong answer. The answer she gave was, you can't challenge my teachings. I received them directly as a vision from Jesus. Well, wrong answer. And, and she was banished from the colony. Well, Eliot was the primary prosecutor for the pastors, and he put the, he put the case together against Anne Hutchinson. So he was deeply respected for his, uh, for his learning. I'll say a little more about that shortly. Uh, he was really, really good at languages. I don't know if I skipped his ability with languages or if it's coming up later, but he, he was really good with languages. I, I think it's coming up. The second thing that was significant was a man by the name of Richard Mather started putting together the Bay Psalm book. And the Bay Psalm book became sort of the hymn book for the colonies. Now, they did not sing uh, human compositions like we do. Um, there weren't very many good human compositions to sing, frankly. But they liked to take the psalms and put them to meter and sing them to various tunes. And John Eliot got involved in putting together the Bay Psalm book, primarily because he was an expert in Hebrew. In fact, he was probably the second or third best Hebrew scholar in the entire colonies. That Psalm book was published in 1640. He was a diligent pastor, a good scholar, a blessing to his people. But if that was the end of it, I wouldn't be telling you his story this morning. That is, there were lots and lots of faithful pastors in small towns doing godly work and Praise the Lord for them. But the reason I'm telling you his story is that when the Puritans went to New England, they were constantly saying, when we get there, we're going to evangelize the continent. That is, there are hundreds of thousands of Native Americans there, of Indians, and they need the gospel, and when we go, we're going to give them the gospel. And you know, it was really easy to say that when you're in England. 
It was real hard to do that when you were in New England. Why? Well, because the Native Americans were a fairly primitive people, which means that they had very different culture, very different traditions. They could be rather savage. Now, savage in a I mean, sinners are sinners, and Europeans could be savage too, as the history shows. But Europeans did it in a little bit more Western cultural way than the Native Americans did, you know, and they, they from the European standpoint, they didn't smell good. They, they smeared bear grease on their bodies to weird, ward off insects. Well, that works, but it doesn't make you socially acceptable to Westerners. And right away they discovered, and they also spoke very difficult languages. That is, the Algonquin languages that were spoken by most of the New England Indians were, sounded like gibberish. They didn't have any written language, no grammars, uh, no dictionaries. It was, it was tough to communicate with them. It speaks to the fact that people are people. That most of the communication that took place between the Indians and the, and the Westerners was the Indians learning our languages. And they did. They learned English so that they could talk with us because we were utterly inept at learning their Indian languages. You say, well, their Indian languages were harder. Probably not. <laughs> we just weren't willing to put the effort out, and they were. And John Eliot said, these Native Americans need the gospel. He developed an intense burden for evangelizing them. And in 1643, he started studying Algonquian, uh, the, the sort of the, the mother language to a number of different sub-languages, like the Narragansett and different ones. They, almost all of these languages that differed one from another were Algonquian as an overall family of languages. The first person who had studied the languages was Roger Williams, the great Baptist. Roger Williams was the very first missionary to the Native Americans of New England, and he had written a book in which he had translated part of the Gospels into the Narragansett language. Now Eliot is studying Algonquian. In three years, he was able to preach a sermon in Algonquian. And that's remarkable. That is, he worked really hard at this. And so, he began a campaign of raising Indian evangelism awareness. Because he's pastoring a church in Roxbury. Now, there are Indians all around, and he's engaging in conversation, but he doesn't have time to be a full-time missionary while he's a full-time pastor. And so he starts writing letters across New England and to England, saying, we need support. We need volunteers. We need money. And in England, a number of Puritans organized what became known as the Corporation for the Promoting and Propagating the Gospel of Jesus Christ in New England, the CCP, the CPPGJCNE. No, I don't think they use an acronym, but, but an organization to support missions. And that organization is going to send a steady supply of money to support missions, and a few volunteers, but not many. For several decades, Eliot's going to be the point man for that organization. He starts writing or supporting the writing of works that advocate Indian missions. They're eventually going to be collected and published as the Eliot Indian Tracts. And they're, again, when, it, when you hear tract, you might think of, you know, a four-page little booklet. These tracts are 75, 80-page mini books, but each one is saying, here's how missions ought to be done, and here's how we ought to do it. He begins preaching in Indian villages during the week and preaching in his home church of Roxbury on Sundays. So he's an extraordinarily busy man. And Native Americans begin to get saved. A number of Massachusetts and other Algonquian Indians. And in, 16, in the late 1640s, Eliot gets an idea that sounds too crazy to work. But he decides to try it. <coughs> he approaches a number of these Native Americans. And he says, you guys who are believers are living in Indian villages with sacums, that is medicine men, and with polytheism, and with all of these pagan rites and superstitions. Why don't you form a village of Christian Indians? Believing Indians. I'll help you. Now, most Native Americans today would consider this like the worst thing a missionary can do. Uh, because it's kind of a westernizing project. 
But Elliot thought this will get them away from all the bad influences in their life. And so in 1651, several dozen of these believing Indians left their villages and formed a town on the New England plan called Natick in Massachusetts. And about a third of the Indians were genuine believers. About two-thirds of them were interested in religion, were willing to go to church, were willing to live like Westerners because they thought Westerners live better than we do. Their culture is better than our culture. And so they found, founded Natick. It was about 25 miles west of Boston. And the people who lived there became known as praying Indians. Elliot said, how can this work? I can't be the governor of Natick, and besides, it's not my job to tell the Indians what to do. So he uh, went to Exodus 18 and read about Jethro giving Moses advice. And he went to the Indians and said, here's what you ought to do. Appoint rulers from among yourselves over hundreds, fifties, and tens with responsibility to maintain law and order and have a mayor of the town who's an Indian. And the town became self-governing, except if there was like a murder or something really high order. That is, the Massachusetts General Court said, that property has been given us by the king, and therefore we have the right to intervene if necessary. But by and large, you can run your own village. And it worked. <coughs> the Indians who lived in the towns, quote, made a solemn covenant to give themselves and their children to God to be his people as the basis of the new civil government. Over the next 23 years, that is from 1651 to 1674, Natick is going to work so well that more and more Indians are going to want to live that way and more and more Indians are going to get saved. Eventually, they're going to establish 13 more praying towns in Massachusetts and Connecticut, 14 of them total. Eliot is going to be instrumental in founding every one of them. Again, he's still pastoring in Roxbury. Uh, they're going to have a total population of about 3,600 people, and about 1,100 of those are going to be... Uh, believers who profess faith in Christ. So about a third of the population are going to be uh, Native Americans who are saved with another about 2,500 who are now living in Western-style towns around Christians who typically are the leaders. It's a remarkable experiment. It's a remarkable experiment. It was really hard to organize congregational churches in these towns. Uh, you got a culture gap. Native Americans are not naturally going to want to worship the way people do in Boston. And that was hard for Elliot to wrap his mind around. All right, I'm not endorsing everything about this, by the way. I'm a Baptist. There are things about this that bother me a little bit. But I sure love the fact that they're trying to evangelize Indians. One of the things that we believe about missions is that we should contextualize in the culture we're evangelizing. That is, there are things that are non-negotiable. We preach, we pray, we give, we worship, uh, we sing, because the New Testament says we should do those things. How should we do them? That's up to each individual culture. All right? it, it would be wrong for me to go into Namibia in Africa and win some Africans to the Lord, and then, then say, all right, we're going to have Sunday morning service at 1030, and you all need to wear coat and tie, and we're going to sing out of a Western hymn book, and that would be ridiculous. I need to find out how Namibians want to do those things that the Bible says. That is, there's no right way or wrong way as long as we're doing the thing the Bible says, right? Uh, well, that missionary thinking... It's not around in the 17th century. That is, Eliot and the rest of the Puritans, they looked at Indians and said, you know what, the way we do it in Europe is the right way, and if you don't do it our way, you're doing it the wrong way. And so these praying towns typically became kind of Western-style towns. 
So organizing churches was tough. Not only did they have a culture gap, but because nearly two-thirds of the Indians are not believers, you've got a lot of discipline problems. That is, these are Reformed churches. Reformed churches are okay with having unbelievers in the membership. That we Baptists are not okay with that. And it creates lots of problems because you've got members who are getting drunk every Saturday night, and that creates church discipline issues. And then there's a dearth of native leadership. You've got Indians who can run the town, but you need much more to run a church. And there just aren't enough Native Americans who understand theology and the Bible well enough to be pastors. It's going to take a while. Now, a man named uh, Dartmouth is going to donate property to a man named Wheelock to start a school for training Indian pastors. And they're going to train Sansom Occam and a number of other Native Americans to pastor churches. But they never have enough to fill these 14 towns. But in 1660, Eliot helped organize a native congregational church in Natick. That was the first one. And over the next 14 years, a church is going to get started in every other town. Praise God. The gospel is being preached in these towns. Meanwhile, Eliot translates the scriptures into the Algonquian dialect for the Massachusetts Indians. It was hard. Uh, there was no word, there were no words in Algonquian to express relationships between time and space. That is, it was a very unphilosophical language, a very concrete language. He had to invent the grammar. He had to, he had to come up with the vocabulary, extensive interviews with the people. And he had to produce a translation that the Indians themselves could read. And he did. He set up a printing press at Cambridge. He, uh, Eliot was on the board of Harvard College for about 40 years. All right, he was a very scholarly man. And he, he, he knew four or five languages. And he, the, the New Testament in the Massachusetts language was printed in 1661. Two years later, he had completed the Old Testament with metrical psalms. 1663, the very first complete Bible printed in America was an Algonquian Bible. And that's kind of cool. That is, no English Bible had yet been printed in America. They were all being transported in from England. And they printed an Algonquian complete Bible. They started founding schools in the praying towns to help the Indians become literate. In 1666, Eliot published The Indian Grammar Begun. And then in 1669, the Indian primer. And then in 1672, the logic primer to try to help the Indians think Western style. He convinced Harvard to build a building for training Indians, but the plan never materialized and Harvard never got behind it. By 1674, it looked like a complete success. Over a thousand believing Indians, 14 praying towns. And then war broke out. Tensions were building. That is, the Native Americans, over time, discovered how land greedy the Europeans were. That, you know, when they first arrived, there were only a few of them. The Native Americans were like, okay, you know, there are a lot more of us than there are of them. We'll be fine. And they've taken a few of our hunting grounds, but that's okay. There's a lot more. And then more arrived, and they started building cities, and more arrived, and they started planting crops, which eliminated hunting grounds. They started cutting down trees, and pretty soon the Native Americans are feeling squeezed. And Roger Williams, who was a close friend to the Indians, and John Eliot, uh, worked to avoid war for about 30 years. And then the old king of the Narragansett died, and his son came to the, to the leadership uh, Westerners nicknamed him King Philip. He has an Indian name I can't pronounce. And King Philip did not like what was happening to his tribes. He could, he could see that the Europeans were going to keep squeezing until they were basically run out of the country. And uh, as this was happening, Eliot's work became more and more dangerous because the Native Americans, who had been pretty easy to work with up until this time, uh, at least many of them were, started getting very dangerous. One story that comes from this is an Indian chief 
who threatens Eliot with a knife. And Eliot said, I am about the work of the great God, and he is with me, so that I fear not all the sackums of the country. I'll go on, and do you touch me if you dare? And uh, the Native American chief uh, apparently was cowed and did not attack him. But in 1675, King Philip's War broke out. Well, read a Wikipedia article about King Philip's War if you're uh, ready for some sadness. It was, in terms of American wars, the worst in casualty count percentage-wise of all the American wars. That is, uh, nearly a third of all the Puritan cities were burned to the ground, towns were burned to the ground. The Native Americans were almost annihilated. It was a brutal, brutal conflict. And what happens to the believing Indians, the praying Indians? Everybody attacks them. That is, to the colonials, they're Indians. To the Native Americans, they're Westerners. And Native Americans attack the praying towns and burn them to the ground. And colonials attack the praying towns and burn them to the ground. And all 14 towns were burned to the ground. Uh, the Indians were dispersed. A number of them fled to Boston for refuge. And because they were, Amer they were Native Americans, because they were Indians, the Bostonians took them and stuck them on prison ships. And disease broke out, and most of them died on the prison ships. They had gone there for refuge, and they, they were, almost all of them died. In about three years, 30 years of work was just left in smolders, just wiped out. And Eliot, after the war, said, uh, now, now by this time, Eliot is 74 years old. And he says, start again. And he goes, and over the objections of the Massachusetts authority, he rebuilds Natick. Surviving Indians gather there. He builds three other towns. He's got four of these towns going. They begin building up their population. But it's really, really hard now. The financial resources that had been paying for this had no confidence in Indian missions now, and they were embittered. The Indians were embittered against white people who had just massacred most of their villages, and the effort failed. By the 19th century, now that's, quite a, that's a long time later, not one convert remained who could read the Bible in the Massachusetts language. That is, it became, Eliot's translation became a historical curiosity. Nobody was using his Bible, and of course English, the languages changed rapidly. And Eliot died in 1690 at the age of 85. His last words were, welcome joy. That is, I'm looking forward to going to heaven. But his work was gone. So let me just assess him a little bit, and then I'll take any questions that you have. In 1691, right after his death, his first, the first biography of Eliot was written, and it was written by the great Cotton Mather. Cotton Mather is the man who wrote uh, the, the earliest history of colonial America and was a great Puritan pastor. And Mather said, John Eliot was one who lived in heaven while he was on earth. And he gave a number of characteristics of him. Let me run through these real quickly. First, he was a man of prayer. It's not an accident or a coincidence that the Indians became known as praying Indians because Eliot taught him to pray. He said, before everything else, you need to learn to pray to the true God. He was a man of prayer. He was a man of charity. And by that I mean he was reckless with his time and resources. He just gave and gave and gave and gave. He poured his life into the Indians and was constantly encouraging his Roxbury church to give to the work, and they caught that fire too. So that as a small village church, they just poured their resources into supporting others. Third, he was a man who recognized his own spiritual needs. They say when he wasn't preaching, when he wasn't giving lectures, he was attending lectures and attending sermons to feed his own soul. He was someone who was constantly growing. Fourth, he was an organized and intentional man. I mean, when I look at Eliot's life, I say, when did he find time to do all this? He preached, catechized, set up schools, trained leaders. He wanted the Indians to be, quote, a well-principled people. 
is the way Cotton Mather put it. Fifth, he was a faithful man. If you live to your mid-80s in the 17th century, you don't see well by the end, you don't hear well by the end, you don't have many teeth by the end, and you're experiencing a lot of health issues. And sure enough, he did. Uh, various physical ailments that made it really hard. And so when I read that at 78, he reorganizes four more praying villages in the, literally the ruins left from the war, I'm like, this is a faithful man. This is a hardworking man. And the key to being faithful is number six, he was a man of faith. That is, his faithfulness flowed out of his faith in God. And I'll let Cotton Mather have the last word. Mather said for many months before he died, he would often cheerfully tell us, so this is first person, that is Mather, talk to Elliot. He would often cheerfully tell us that he was shortly to go to heaven and that he would carry a deal of good news thither with him. He said he would carry tidings to the old founders of New England, which were now in glory, that church work was yet carried on among us, that the number of our churches was continually increasing, and that the churches were still kept as big as they were by the daily additions of those that shall be saved. What I just heard in that quote was optimism. I can't see that I would have been optimistic at that point. But, but he was convinced that his job was to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. It's the Lord's job to not make it vain. And if the Lord did not want the praying towns to survive, if the Lord wanted the Native Americans to, to disperse north and west, if the Lord, what the Lord wants is best. It's best. Even if you know, William Cooper in his famous poem said, uh, uh, dare, we dare not judge by feeble sense. That is, what we see can often see very small and unsuccessful and not going anywhere. But God's the one who's given the increase. And Eliot, because of his faith, was able to maintain this, the optimism of faith, the positive faith attitude um, one of my old professors used to call it, Gilbert Fremont used to say, we need a positive faith attitude. It's not just a positive attitude. That can be cockeyed optimism. It's a positive faith attitude. God's got everything under control. And that's, that's the thing I think I love most about Eliot, mm -hmm. is that he poured his life into something that looked like it went up in flames, and yet he knew that his labor was not in vain in the Lord. Any questions on his life and ministry? Yes, sir, Pastor. You described some, or were some of the first independent churches uh, in, in the region? Or were there well, any before? The Puritan churches were technically autonomous. That is, they were all officially congregational. So each church, Boston, Salem, Concord, New Haven, each one had a church which was officially autonomous congregational polity. But it was kind of a, it wasn't exactly Baptist because these pastors would get together for periodic meetings and discuss problems in the churches and give mutual, and it, it was a little bit stronger. It was sort of semi-Presbyterian. Eliot participated in all that. The Native American churches were very, were very strictly autonomous. Each praying town had a church that kind of ran itself. But then again, if, if the venerable Mr. Elliot came and said, you guys ought to do this, he, he was almost like an apostle among them, where you can understand, he, he had led many of them to the Lord, he had organized their churches. So while they were autonomous, uh, he had a lot of moral authority among them. So it, if, they had, if they had not been wiped out by a war, it would be interesting to see what would have happened to them after his death. Uh, the, the four villages more or less dispersed within a generation or so after his death. So I think they were leaning on him probably too much. But, you know, I don't know how else humanly you, I don't know how you fix that. You know. Yes, sir. Indian 
language to America that I, I, it's just amazing that you can do that. You know, yeah. I forgot how, you, how long you started writing. It took him three years to be preaching in it. It was another, oh, it was another almost 15 years before he was able to translate the Bible into it. That's a much bigger task. But everyone needs the scriptures in their heart language. And even though most of these Native Americans probably learned enough English to interact with the newcomers, uh, it's not the same when you're reading the Bible in a language which you didn't grow up with. Uh, you just can't get it at the same, in the same way. Now, I, I can't speak to the quality of Eliot's translation. It's a historical curiosity now, and it's, I mean, it survived, we, we, but nobody uses it now. I mean, it was amazing that he could take the Indian language and translate it to English. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's a wonderful it's, achievement. It's a long time. Yeah, and, and that's one of the things that the study of missions will direct us to, mm -hmm. to be, to fully contextualize in any culture we must learn the language of that culture. We must be immersed in it. And every significant missionary that I teach on um, is involved in translation work. We'll talk about Lottie Moon tonight. She was amazing with languages. And she spoke Chinese like a, like a Chinese person by the end. That's, that's what it takes. And by the way, we are not called into a, another language culture, but we need, we need to be able to speak the language of the cultures we're called to. We, we, need to, we need to understand the way people are thinking and the way people are speaking and, and whatever that culture is. Your culture happens to be Monroe, but um, that's, that's what we're called to. My, my, my culture is college students. I, I have a hard time keeping up with their language, but I, I work at it. <laughs> yes, ma'am. How old was he when he was going to Colombia? Uh, he was 27 when he first got there. And he married a year later at age 28. Yes, ma'am. So how many, how many years was he working with the Indians before the settlers kind of came in and started pulling areas into the north? Well, the war starts in 1675, and Natick is founded in 1651. So it was 24 years of getting these 14 villages going, 1,100 converts, growing churches. And then the war in 1675 just, just wiped it all out. Yes, sir. And Chuck. Then Mary and her first met her at the funeral of her island. Mm -hmm. So that was the father of Captain Morgan? Yes, Richard. Uh, well, he was his grandfather, actually. Richard Mather, who put together the Baysom book with help from a couple of others, including Eliot, was the father of Increase Mather, who became one of the great Puritan preachers. His son was Cotton Mather, who writes uh, Magnalia Christi Americana. And, uh, and also a biography of John Eliot. Yeah, so he started kind of on the ground floor, basically. Right? <laughs> oh, yeah, Richard Mather was one of the original founders of New England, and, yeah, the Mather family was very prestigious in Boston. Yeah, I've never told the story of any of the Mathers in here, but they're, they're an interesting group. All right, well, thank you so much for your attention. I hope you can learn valuable lesson from Elliot, the main thing being to not grow weary in well-doing. We shall reap in due season if we faint not. Thank you, Lord, for these men and women, the privilege of sharing this mission story with them. Thank you, Lord, that John Elliot is in heaven now serving you. And uh, thank you for how you used him. And every one of those Indians who profess faith in Christ is with you as well, and we will worship forever with them. Bless our morning service. Pray that you would be glorified in it. And I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.